I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. India's very own travel podcast where each week we discuss the story of travelers in their own words and reel up their experiences with you our listeners. Hi guys, I'm your host Saif and welcome to an all new episode of The Musafir Stories. Today we have with us a very special guest, Satyarup Siddhanta, a professional mountaineer from West Bengal who in 2017 became the first Bengali civilian to complete the seven summits. that's the seven highest peaks on the seven continents he is also only the fifth person from india to achieve this amazing feat satya is a certified mountaineer from the himalayan mountaineering institute in darjeeling and is also the president and founder of a better a foundation for a better tomorrow so buckle up and get ready to find out where satya is taking us today so with that introduction I'd like to welcome Satyarup Siddhanta to the Musafir Stories. Satya, thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir Stories and welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Satya. It's really a good fortune that um, we have you, an avid uh, and professional mountaineer, come speak to us and share your story with our listeners. It's it's um, our pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I would say that I am not a... Uh... professional mountaineer as in professional mountaineer <laughs> i <laughs> i love to climb mountains uh, yes and uh, yeah it all started uh, uh, with a very humble beginning uh-huh. i actually it was never my dream to go and climb mountains because it was a kind of impossible dream for me i was uh, an asthmatic kid the whole of my school life and till my college days i had to use inhaler to even walk on uh, normal roads so uh, from there to think of uh, climbing a small hill itself is a huge challenge and uh, here we are talking about uh, everest and highest mountain of all the continents <laughs> so yeah you know the journey was very very fascinating to me as well so when i look back it becomes uh, Wow. <laughs> I know. So uh, absolutely it's something to be really really proud of and uh, uh, gives you a sense of the sheer determination and the sheer will power, right? You can go from being an asthmatic kid uh, to scaling something like the Mount Everest and uh, I I know Mount Everest is huge everybody knows that but uh, just to compare that in terms of um, say modern buildings <laughs> Uh, it's uh, more than 10 times as tall as the burj khalifa the tallest building in the world right so <laughs> that's what we're speaking about and uh, it's really really commendable that um, you've uh, you've uh, been able to do this and we're really happy to have you on the podcast satya but before we get into details satya when did uh, mountaineering or um, the love of mountaineering and mountains start like uh, how long does this date back to so in 2008 i went uh, i actually saw a picture of a hill uh-huh. and i was so fascinated by it uh, just because i never thought that i can go and uh, do some trekking or things like that but uh-huh. when i saw that picture and you won't believe that picture was not of uh, himalayas not of alps not of uh, andes but that picture was uh, just a, a small hill in tamil nadu called parvat malai uh-huh. Uh, and uh, i was very very fascinated by it and uh, then i decided to go for that trek mm. but given that my history of asthma and i was not sure that uh, whether i should go or whether i should not go but then finally i bought a new inhaler and i uh, went there without letting anyone know that i was um, uh, having asthma uh-huh. so when i went to that particular trek we were 10 people and when we reached the top of that hill mm-hmm. uh, it was not only the satisfaction of uh, reaching the top of a hill but it was also a kind of a sense of freedom uh, that you know that uh, asthma is uh, gone i mean like at least it didn't come between me and my mountains Absolutely. and then there was no looking back and i started trekking all over the western ghats uh-huh. uh, and till 2010 and then in 2010 december i went to everest base camp Okay. And uh, uh, I didn't know anything about uh, Everest before that, except that it was the highest mountain. But mm. when I saw it in front of me, 
I think Everest did cast a spell on me and I was just spellbound and we were there for more than two hours watching it and uh, there were the plumes and it was so mystique yeah. and uh, I decided that I, I in fact promised Everest that I'm going to come back. Mm. And uh, but that time also I didn't know what was mountaineering. I thought it was just a trick. But then when I came back after the base camp trek and I started reading some literatures about that, mm-hmm. and I was shocked. This is a, this is a totally different ball game altogether. It's not just a trick. And uh, and then I got to know that oh there is a field called mountaineering as well. And uh, uh, and the sheer cost of that expedition uh, in that time it was told that it it cost uh, 35 lakhs and i was so heartbroken <laughs> so <laughs> and because yeah, this i was is back in 2010 you're saying yeah 2010 december and i was counting literally that how many years i should work without touching my salary to manage that amount of money and then uh, it, it, the number was definitely not so pleasing number and uh, i almost gave up but then one fine day i thought why not uh, what if I can get a lottery in KVC or something like that? <laughs> uh, will I be able to go? But the answer was no, because uh, it's just just not about the money. You need to have a right amount of skill exactly. and you need to have a right amount of experience. Mm. Then I thought, so if a situation like that ever comes, I should be prepared and uh, wait for that right moment. Who knows? Like, you know, if not today, if not tomorrow, Maybe at the age of 50, I'll go, but I'll go. Because that, that is one dream that I have seen and uh, how can I let go my dream? So then I went in 2011, December, I went for Himalayan Mountaineering Institute in Darjeeling. Okay. And uh, got my first exposure in mountaineering. Mm. And uh, like, you know, that's how my journey of uh, mountaineering started. Excellent. And then uh, just to give our listeners a little bit of a background, uh, before this, Satya uh, was or is an um, IT engineer, right? You are an IT professional mm-hmm. and uh, your <laughs> first stint with professional mountaineering or going to a mountaineering school was in 2011, just before this trick. Yeah, so 2011 uh, to go... Uh, I applied in January 2011 uh-huh. for a course of December 2011 and since you know IT companies uh, don't have a policy of having that many leave uh-huh. for one month and all so every time I used to do some good work good job I used to whenever I used to get a pat on the back uh-huh. I used to remind my I used to remind my uh-huh. managers that uh, I need one month leave and I used to take those opportunities and uh, uh, to ensure that I have more such opportunities, I started working even harder and smarter and I used to go finish projects much before deadlines uh, such that I used to get opportunity to talk to my bosses in US and Korea and every time I used to bring that and then they said, yeah, yeah don't worry, we'll give you. And that's how I went there. But uh, yeah, after 2011 December, when I <coughs> decided to get some exposure, I uh, decided to go and climb Kilimanjaro. Now, when I was doing some research on Kilimanjaro, I came across that Kilimanjaro was a part of the seven summits. Mm-hmm. And I was very curious that what is the seven summits? And uh, when I started reading about it, it was mind-blowing. The seven summits is climbing the highest mountain of uh, each of the continents, like seven mountains, seven continents. And it was like, wow, <laughs> what uh, what good an excuse can it be uh, to roam around the world, right? <laughs> but then uh, I started laughing at my own dreams because uh, here I was talking about Everest, which was uh, so costly and uh, that is only an impossible dream. And now I'm uh, even going beyond <laughs> stretching my dreams from not only <laughs> one mountain, but all the seven mountains that too, not in one place, but seven corners of the world. So, uh, but then again, I thought, why not take baby steps and see like, you know, what if I do this, then what would be my next mountain? Okay, what if I do that as well? What would be my next? So like that, I planned out the entire uh, uh, mountain that what I should do after what. Uh, and then I said, let me take one at a time. And uh, I still remember that I went for my first trek, uh, swiping my credit card, thinking that I will get my uh, yearly bonus at the end of the year. Uh-huh. And then I can come back and pay back that money. Uh-huh. Unfortunately, that year I didn't get my bonus. <laughs> and the whole year, whole year went to pay back that money for Kilimanjaro. Uh-huh. Then the next year, I went to Mount Elbrus, which is the highest mountain of Europe. Uh-huh. And uh, this time again, I went and swiped the credit card thinking that last year I didn't get bonus fine, but they cannot uh, deny me this year. Uh-huh. Uh, and 
Uh, irony was that second year also I didn't get my bonus. <laughs> <laughs> get anxiety companies play with us. <laughs> so then I decided that let me not um, uh, think of any variable pay as a as a component that which was ever mine. Uh, uh, but then third time also I thought, you know what, three times it cannot happen. Third time and lucky. I, I, I third time I went and took some loans and went uh, and did some uh, credit card swiping to go for the highest mountain in South America, Mount Aconcagua, mm-hmm. and uh, it's in Argentina. Yeah. And guess what? That year also I didn't get my bonus. <laughs> and that was like <laughs> horrible. But uh, but then I started living with it rather than craving about it. And uh, then I got an opportunity to go and climb the Mobla. Uh, so a lot of people think uh, that Elbrus is not the highest of uh, Europe. Uh, Mobula should be climbed, and then I thought, why not climb both of the, both the uh, both the peaks as that there is no more controversies. <laughs> and uh, then this was in September 2014, and uh, in June I went for Mount Denali, um, also called Mount McKinley, which is the highest mountain of North America in near Alaska. I literally had no more money after all these loans and all these credit cards. Uh-huh. And that forced us to go unguided. And that mountain is such that, like, you know, oh. not, not, very, uh, not many people have dared to go unguided. Right. So it was a huge risk. But we didn't want it to prove our bravado. But uh, it was just that we didn't have any other options. And uh, uh, then I made a team of five friends um, from Nepal, from Bangladesh, from uh, Canada, from US. And then I, from, I was from India. And we eventually went and climbed uh, Mount Denali. So that gave me a huge confidence uh, after climbing Mount Denali and Mount Mobla and I decided to uh, pursue uh, Mount Everest. Uh, but then the cost of the expedition, we tried to reduce a lot and uh, we almost brought down one third of um, like, you know, what was the going rate. But um, and I, I had to do a lot of crowdfunding for that. I took some loans and uh, finally went for Mount Everest in 2015. And as we were approaching the base camp, mm-hmm. Everest decided not to entertain us. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And there was a huge earthquake in Nepal Correct. in 2015. And more than 10,000 people died. Yeah. In and, and the base camp, it triggered uh, a big avalanche. Mm-hmm. Almost 21 people died in base camp. The Everest uh, expedition got cancelled. And it was shocking because uh, that much money was lost in a second. And the dreams were broken and crushed I know. and uh, I didn't know what to do but uh, but then I composed myself back and brought back all my um, broken dreams and again started building on that now when I came back I decided to so by that time I had to leave my job and go because uh, there was no leave for three months and uh, I knew that if I come back alive I'll definitely get a job somewhere doesn't matter but but then my company was uh, kind enough to give me a consulting job uh, and that me to go beyond the policies of the company. And so I came back uh, from Everest and I decided to go and climb the highest mountain of Australia, which was Mount Kosciuszko. Uh-huh. Uh, a small hill, uh, so one and a half hour uh, marching pit. And uh, we went there and came back. But then there was again another hitch that, you know, uh, there are, the whole mountaineering community has been divided into two, where uh, first a group, they believe that Kosciuszko is the highest mountain of Australia. But uh, Misner, who is the uh, father figure of modern day mountaineering, he has another list called Misner's list of seven summits. Uh, the earlier one is a bus list. So Misner is to say that uh, uh, the highest mountain of Australia belongs uh, in West Papua, Island, Papua New Guinea Island in West Papua. Uh, and uh, since Australia, Australasia and Oceania is actually formed of Australia, New Zealand and some islands, which uh, Papua New Guinea also belongs to. And the plates of Australia did hit uh, the Papua New Guinea. So that's why the highest mountain there should be called as the highest mountain of Australia. And here also I decided to do both because <laughs> I didn't want someone to point a finger at me that, oh, you haven't done that. So, <laughs> yeah, I think the, by the uh, sounds of it, the seven summits would easily turn into 14 summits, I think, uh, if there's a controversy for every continent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I uh, said, nine, uh, it became nine actually. So yeah. and uh, then uh, what I did was uh, I went and uh, so after Kosciuszko, I uh, again planned for Everest in 2016. Right. 
and uh, went and climbed Mount Everest in 2016 on 21st May. Before you get on with the journey to the Everest, uh, just like to say hats off to your uh, sheer persistence and determination, Satya, that uh, despite and in spite of all the adversities that you've faced, that you've come back and back again and stronger each time. Uh, in uh, in spite of all the controversies, the adversities, the earthquakes and whatnot. So hats off to uh, all this sheer uh, courage and determination that you've shown all along. Um, but if I had to ask you, just in terms of um, preparation before you did Mount Everest, I know uh, you'd been doing and you'd been like active in terms of uh, mountaineering, right? Even before you did the Everest trek in 2016. Uh, but in terms of uh, preparation and uh, acclimatization, how early does this process start and for Everest, I started my preparation three months before. Okay. Uh, so I hailed from West Bengal, and that's why uh, it's very common to have a sweet tooth. And I was no, <laughs> I was no exception. And uh, I hog chocolates and ice creams and sweets like everything in the whole year. Yes, good luck. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to stereotype, but uh, it's one of my favorites too. <laughs> yeah, and uh, th- that, that uh, exponentially increases my weight every time I go to Kolkata and come back. <laughs> and uh, But then uh, just before the expedition, any of the expeditions, like three months before the expedition, I start okay. uh, my regime okay. where uh, sweets are big no-no for me that time and uh, my diet changes to protein food and less carbohydrate and then a lot of uh, exercises and I do have a checklist before I go for an expedition okay. that before I have to go for a mountain, I need to complete uh, all these lists and okay. this list includes uh, a six minute plank, 14 and a half kilometer run, uh, two kilometer uh, swimming, 45 kilometer running, uh, 125 floats going up and down. Like, you know, so they, 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 oh, wow. like, <laughs> no, it's yeah, not I mean, in one day, but uh, I, mean, I mean, like, yeah, still, over that period, if I can reach those, those milestones, yeah. I believe that uh, I am fit enough now to go for those expeditions. And then I set up a a uh, small uh, gym at my house itself uh, because uh, uh, to support for my expedition i started working at two places uh, i used to leave my office uh, leave for office for a morning 10 o'clock and finish one office then go to the other office finish that office and come back every day at 11 30 in the night it was getting very difficult to get up and get into those uh, group classes uh, for gym uh, uh, so then i decided to hire an instructor who would come and wake me up and ensure that I don't miss on those uh, essential trainings. Okay. And uh, that included, again, uh, cardio and strength and endurance, uh, everything. So that's how I prepared for Mount Everest. In terms of the duration, how long of a duration is this, like like setting out for the expedition to uh, getting back? How long is this? Uh, it's almost uh, two months. Okay. Uh, 55 days and uh, you cannot go and climb uh, Mount Everest in one shot Correct. so you have to go to the base camp then acclimatize and our human body is not tuned to the altitude exactly. there like you know it is tuned to a sea level kind of thing right yeah. so um, there has to be a lot of physiological changes that needs to go through in our body yeah. and we need to give some time to that uh, to our body in a scientific way yeah. and uh, one such catalyst is to go up and then come down, go up higher and sleep in the higher altitude, come down like that. You know. So we had to do two iterations before we actually went for the summit. To the summit, yeah. Yeah. We, what are the stops uh, you make? Like, are there stops? Uh, say, you said base camp is one of them, right? So how many uh, similar stops are there before you kind of hit, hit the summit? Right. So there are four camps okay. before summit. Mm-hmm. Uh, after base camp, there are four camps. Right. Uh, now, only in the first iteration, we stay in the first camp. Uh-huh. After that first iteration, we just take a five minutes halt in the first camp okay. and we directly go to the second camp. Okay. Um, so first time when we went, we went to first camp, stayed there. The next day, we went to camp two, stayed mm-hmm. there. Next day, we went uh, near the Lhotse face a little bit ahead, around 200 meters more and came back to camp two. Mm-hmm. The next day, we came back to this camp. Okay. So then this is the first iteration. Then the next iteration... We directly went to Camp 2 uh, with a small halt in Camp 1. Mm-hmm. And, uh, we went to Camp 2. Uh, from Camp 2, we went to uh, the base of that uh, Lhotse face again yeah. and came back. Then the next day, we went direct to Camp 3, mm-hmm. stayed for some t- time there and came back to Camp 2. Mm-hmm. And the next day, we came back to base camp. Okay. Then in the final summit push, we went to Camp 2, then to Camp 3, 
then final summit and came back like you know so this whole process right uh, and there has to be some adequate rest in between so this takes almost 55 days exactly, uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah and and if i speak about the team you went with uh, like how was this uh, satya was this like a group of friends or uh, like you have uh, shared paths also i'm assuming so uh, how is the team Uh, yeah so uh, there were multiple teams uh, from bengal itself okay. and uh, since i knew most of them so i decided to go with them okay. and uh, the our team was four member team mm. and uh, we uh, were safe and sound except uh, uh, one of our team members lost a finger yeah but uh, the other team other team other two teams there were like you know one team member in one team uh, they she lost mm. eight fingers uh, eight fingers and uh, she had to be rescued and uh, uh, other team three of the four members died and one was brought back with one finger had to be amputated yeah it's really yeah. scary to even uh, listen to these things so uh, imagine going through these things as you're uh, making the push for the summit right uh, it uh, needs tremendous well power and focus as well like not just physical i think it's not just the physical strength it's a lot of emotional and mental strength as well Yeah, uh, you have to be very, very strong emotionally, mentally, and um, there would be situations which would demand pushing your limits. Like uh, when I was going up in the ca- from camp two to camp three, uh, one shape uh, fell down from the top and just slipped past by us, and uh, it was very shocking. I mean, I have never seen someone die on the mountains like that, and. Uh, i was like frozen uh, frozen yeah. in fear and this and that yeah not But just then, literally <laughs> yeah and uh, then i had to like you know apply a lot of nlp techniques so i was in a shock state mm. uh, after i reached to camp 3 i was trying to uh, sleep and that was the last sleep before you go to camp 4 and summit there was no sleep after that mm-hmm. so uh, well, actually whenever i was trying to close my eyes i was seeing that guy falling and uh, that was a big uh, emotional problem uh, but then i decided to look it into through another way mm. i realized that if somebody falls from the top like that uh, by the time he reaches uh, 100 meters he will be already dead by heart attack or something right, right. so then i changed the whole paradigm mm. to think that i actually didn't see someone fall into his death but i saw a dead body falling mm. you know and the whole the equation changed and then i could uh, console myself and i could sleep and yeah. like there are a lot of uh, this kind of thing happens on mountains and uh, even this time when i uh, went to uh, antarctica in december mm-hmm. so um, the cold the extreme cold and extreme uh, the remoteness uh, can create a lot of uh, uh, emotional impact right and uh, i in fact uh, had multiple expeditions stitched mm-hmm. uh, so oh, i went to vincent massif the highest mountain of antarctica to complete my seven summits right. i then just immediately after that i went to uh, ski to the south pole uh, by skiing around 111 kilometers from 89 degree south to 90 degree south oh, wow. and again i immediately after that i went to chile and climbed the highest volcano in the world uh, active volcano mm. mount ocelado and then i also as a preparation i climbed uh, uh, three more mountains there like you know so physical strength stamina everything is required fine but your mental health is also very very important absolutely uh, just like like you know uh, between the everest and uh, antarctica i went to uh, karstens pyramid which i was talking about mm. the highest of australia which is in papua new guinea yeah so there the challenges were totally different even uh, the jungle is known for cannibalism uh, oh, okay. still and uh, there are a lot of tribes and they are with their bows and arrows and everything mm. and uh, the roads there were no route as such uh, you had to cross rivers you had to uh, like you know the mud and everything i mean like you know and then when you go uh, to the summit it is also like you know very technical peak so each of these mountains demands a certain respect uh, and a certain kind of preparation uh, mm-hmm. such that you know uh, and the mental uh preparation is very very important uh, along with the uh, other physical aspects of it uh, satya just getting back to your uh, everest everest expedition right T- tell us a little bit about the uh, views and the uh, the things you used to see around you while you were making i mean i know obviously it looks stunning in the pictures and all of that but i think at that altitude and that um physical duress that you're going through uh, 
everything changes, right? But uh, what are some of the views and the things that you could experience while you were making the push to the summit? Yeah, uh, it's an amazing place to be there. And I think uh, on a view like there at the Everest Base Camp mm-hmm. is something, I mean, only you can dream that, you know, uh, <laughs> that kind of view. Sure. Unless you go there, I mean, it's very difficult to experience, like to explain that what kind of view it is. But uh, as... Uh, we go up the terrain changes the in fact right from Kathmandu when we start we take a flight to Lukla uh, and Lukla airport is the high is uh, one of those highest uh, airports in the world mm-hmm. and uh, is one of those dangerous <laughs> airports in the world sure. it's a very small runway and then from there when we start uh, trekking you see amazing view uh, all around and uh, uh, mountain rivers flowing by and greenery and as you go up 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 the tree line slowly slowly decreases yeah. and um, then you look around the snow comes in and then finally uh, when you reach the Everest base camp you have Lhotse in front and uh, Kumbu icefall the most notorious house icefall there yeah. <laughs> you know so it's right in front of you and you know that this is the challenge which is looking at you day in and day out because all the two months mostly you stay in base camp and you are staying just on the ice fall in the lower part but you can see the whole uh, ice fall in front of you and that's like a very shaky area a shaky area means there are huge towers of ice uh, and these are all unstable towers like Mm. you know in different angles and in any time it can fall off when you should start from base camp to camp 2 or camp 1 like you know Mm. uh, we literally had to start early in the morning like three o'clock in the morning uh-huh. uh, such that uh, uh, while we cross it it's still cold and it doesn't melt and it doesn't tumble on us sure. uh, in 2014 actually like that one uh, in, in the ice fall uh, 14 shapers died yeah. because of an avalanche and uh, that uh, slid off a lot of ice falls and all yeah. so uh, then even in those areas we are not supposed to even sneeze or cough or stand at one point for a long time exactly. so keep moving yeah. uh, so uh, but then as we were going from inside that areas and everything it was so peaceful and so silent and uh, so beautiful and there were these uh, creations of nature by itself uh, so some sculpture got formed naturally and you yeah. feel like that's a that looks like an eagle that looks like this that I was like amazing it is and then yeah. when you go to the top part of the Kumbu ice fall and then there are a lot of crevices and uh, it crossed those mm. and uh, in one such instance I fell down in a crevice oh and, wow okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, there are some interesting things also like you know that day when I fell down in that crevice the temperature there went and hit almost uh, 40 degrees centigrade which is unimaginable wow. uh, but because that that's because the natural formation of that place uh, resembles almost like a solar cooker kind and uh, it becomes very hot during a clear sky yeah. and that made the snow much softer and uh, one of the snow bridge broke and I fell down with the entire section. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, I had my uh, safety line. I was uh, hooked to the safety line and I was hanging there in a, cl- in a crevice for more than 25 minutes uh, waiting for rescue. That must have felt like forever, right? 25 minutes. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. So when I fell down, uh, when I fell down there, I fell down and um, it was so sudden. I didn't even realize that what is happening. And right. suddenly I saw myself hanging there and everything is falling on me. And uh, it was my mistake that I waited near the crevice end a little longer. Mm-hmm. I was taking rest because it was so hot. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the slack of the rope was almost six feet. Mm-hmm. And I went inside and hanging there at six feet. So I thought that it must be a very small crevice. Uh-huh. I'll, get, I'll get out and uh, climb up. And uh, I just wanted to see how deep it is, so that whether I will jump or whether I can walk down. Like, you know, just I thought it just some other crew was like, and when I looked down, it was complete dark. I just hold back the rope again, like, you know. Oh my <laughs> and, God. Then, <laughs> yeah. so, and then I tried to understand how deep it is. So I broke a small piece of uh, snow block uh-huh. and threw it down to hear the sound. I couldn't hear the sound. Oh, now wow. this, time, this time I got a b- bigger one, bigger block. And I threw it, I couldn't hear the sound. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then I, Bottomless, it's like abyss, really. Yeah, I mean, like it's an abyss. And I can't see also, like it's a dark inside. 
and uh, then somehow anchored myself there uh, with uh, with my back and legs put forward uh, so that i don't want to hang and uh, open up any of the end uh, loose ends yeah. in the top uh, then i knew that there was no point trying to get out and loose things up uh, rather than let me wait mm. and while i was waiting i just wanted to uh, capture the video there uh, and i was looking for my camera and i was so upset that i couldn't find my camera uh, it, it it got stuck between my bag and my back uh but then i thought let me record the whole place in my natural camera that's my eyes <laughs> and uh, it was you won't believe that place was so nice inside and it was so silent and just in movies and uh, national geographic how you get to see that yeah. blue eyes inside and the crack has gone uh, like extreme and this side and that side and like a snake yeah. and you look there and you could see some uh, the top are covered in most of the places and mm-hmm. it is um, translucent and some like light is coming inside and making it such a beautiful place i mean i can't even imagine unless and until i have <laughs> fallen down i wouldn't have uh, appreciated that place uh, but then after some time my i could hear the footsteps of my friends and i shouted for help and then finally uh, i was rescued but yeah I, <laughs> that <laughs> yeah, was that's, uh, something sounds scary like, i mean uh, you're trying to see the good part of it but i'd be freaked out <laughs> I was stuck. No, I mean, I knew that um, now that I have fallen into that, I think this is what mountain taught me uh-huh. that to try to accept things that you know, yes, shit happened. <laughs> <laughs> uh, better accept it. Like then try to figure out once you accept it, because we constantly keep ourselves in denial mode, right? Yeah. And then planning, can we uh, find that what can go wrong? Okay, this can go wrong. How can I reduce the impact? Okay, this way. Now let's not panic about it. Let's think how do I get out of this and stuff and all. Even similarly. just when we were about to reach the everest top mm. uh, you know around 8800 meter uh-huh. we were at the south summit top my left eye went blind uh, temporary blindness oh, oh. i couldn't oh. see anything and just after 10 minutes from that my uh, oxygen mask failed and got blocked <laughs> These yeah. all sound like I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but these all sound like twists in a thriller movie or something. Uh, I yeah, mean, uh, it's, it's so <laughs> brave of you to uh, I mean go through all of this and still make it to the summit. I mean, did I have a choice? I mean, like <laughs> I know that it's gone. I mean, like now let me at least go to the summit and die rather than <laughs> die halfway. <laughs> and I you know so it was. Uh, crazy and then at that altitude also around after half an hour i went uh, without supplemental oxygen and it was like one third of the oxygen and God. as i was uh, heading towards the summit uh-huh. and i was 10 minutes before my i started getting cramps in my body indicating indicating that i need oxygen now no matter what right. and at that point i kept my head cool and uh, i had to bargain for um, a mask from my uh, sherpa friend and uh, uh, i could give him some logic and <laughs> finally Uh, he agreed to give me for 10 minutes his mask and that's with that i went ahead and uh, climbed the everest and uh, at the top it was such beautiful place to be i mean like you were literally in the top of the world and yeah, exactly that- yeah uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about the feeling i know it pictures can't do justice to it so uh, I'm, i'm i'm sure it's a unique feeling that you can't even describe but just give us a little bit of a sense as to how you felt once you reached the summit like this is what you'd been working for like all these months and then you've reached there and then having come through all these challenges how was the feeling what were you thinking so when <laughs> i reached to that top area uh-huh. not the top part but the area and i could see some flags ahead and i was like is this the summit uh-huh. I, like, i can't believe i'm like i'm there <laughs> and uh, i was looking around and it was amazing i was looking left and right and i was like enjoying the whole view uh-huh. but immediately uh i knew that i had to go back fast because my oxygen mask malfunctioned so right I, but then it was like a switch you know switching from here to there again switching back and again i was going towards the top part and as i was approaching that the uh, highest point uh-huh. uh, i could feel that you know that this is that place where so many people so many mountaineers it was a dream for so many people so exactly. many people died coming here so many people became great after coming here i mean like this is the place where tenzing and hilary and mallory everybody dreamed of this and i am here i mean like i couldn't believe and you know the eyes were turning moist and then i went and sat at the top part and i was like looking around sitting there and like you know wow and it was just early morning like 5:45 we reached uh-huh. and it was windy still it was cold but then i forgot everything and i was like absorbing the nature from there 
but immediately i realized that oh i have to go back uh, let me take some pictures and go back <laughs> and you won't believe three of my cameras failed at the top oh wow and i was list. like uh-huh. oh yeah and then <laughs> i was like breaking my head and i found my uh, other friend was coming and i was so happy that he has the camera at least uh-huh. so when i approached him so he was also enjoying and I was like come fast come fast and when he came <laughs> i see the camera was on his uh, neck and he said his camera is also dead uh-huh. and uh, he thought that i was carrying so many cameras so he uh-huh. didn't bring, he didn't bring a spare camera okay. and there i was sitting on the top of uh, mount everest uh, along with my friend and sherpa in like three days and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thinking that now my oxygen mask is malfunction like and i have to give back my mask anytime now and uh, i don't know whether i'll be able to go back alive or not nobody will believe that i have come to this top uh, <laughs> and next year that i'll come and prove them that i have really come last year also that also will not be available if i don't reach back safe and then there were some chinese uh, side there were some people uh, who submitted and they were clicking some pictures okay and uh, initially i tried to get their attention and tried to get a picture or so but then i realized at 8848 meter is not the right place to exchange business cards <laughs> <laughs> like you know send me in the email yeah exactly <laughs> and then i like and then um, like a twist again I saw another Sherpa. He was uh, he took out the camera and he was clicking selfies. Okay. And I, and he was the person who denied giving me initially his mask. And he thought that I am asking his mask again. So <laughs> and he was not even doing an eye contact also. And then you know, so, so like lot of lot of uh, lot of stories there. And you know, and then finally I could click some pictures and even got a 360 degree view of oh the God. video. And as I was about to give my back my mask. Uh-huh. I saw that uh, the Sherpa friend he was using my mask and I was shocked that how can how come he can use my mask because it was not working right and um, then he pointed out to the sun and he saw that the sun came up and the block went uh, uh, okay and I was like good I'll not die <laughs> only frozen right <laughs> yeah it was frozen actually and good. then the block got okay and then finally I could come back and like you know so like <laughs> every has like so many so many stories and i think you need many more uh, uh, episodes to tell all the stories <laughs> <laughs> it probably take up a season <laughs> wow and how long did you stay at the summit for uh, wait there's so almost, much happening uh, i'm just wondering how long minutes. it was for yeah almost 45 minutes okay. even that took me at all for staying that long and uh, while coming down i was facing some problems and i even slept off at one place <laughs> but <laughs> yeah this is crazy this <laughs> Sounds uh, unreal at so many points, and and uh, I guess even because of the height you are and the, how thin the oxygen levels are and everything, uh, yeah, exactly. I'm sure your brain also not, doesn't function like normally, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a hypoxic situation happens when you are exactly. there with uh, so less oxygen. Uh, fortunately, I didn't see any um, hallucinations and stuff <laughs> like that. But there are a lot of instances where people right. do that and jump off and all those things. Yes, yeah, she's truly amazing and uh, <laughs> this is the first time I'm uh, speaking uh, at length about a summit and uh, what better way than it being Mount Everest. <laughs> I know you as you said it you have to be there to kind of experience it but uh, thank you so much for explaining it so well for our um, listeners and then kind of giving us a flavor of uh, how it is and uh, what the challenges one has to go through and and uh, as I said I've been repetitive over the course of the podcast but hats off to you for um, going through all these adversities be it your um uh, say, say physical constraints in the form of asthma or financial at some point and uh, even um, emotional and mental at so many levels uh, yeah, given the deaths of people you looked at who were friends who started off with you or even the earthquake and everything just before you started off the previous year and all of that so hats off to you we are so, we are so glad that uh, you made it and you are the first from karnataka i mean Uh, yeah <laughs> now we'll say you are from karnataka even <laughs> the bible yeah of course uh, this is my karma for me uh, i exactly. have been in karnataka from 2005 onwards and uh, my janma for me is uh, bengal and but my karma for me is here and with all your support i think um, like in you know, in my next venture that i am doing now i need all your support and well wishes so i am climbing the highest volcano of all the seven continents and i am already done with three Uh, that's called the seven volcanic summits and now i am left with four more and uh, hopefully by next january i should be able to complete all this absolutely seven. our, our uh, good wishes are obviously with you but tell us how one can um, contribute to this expedition and to this effort that you are undertaking satya 
Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, before the expeditions, uh, which are beyond my capacity, I do some crowdfunding. Uh-huh. And for that, you need to follow my Facebook page to okay. get uh, get uh, more information when the next expedition is coming. Mm-hmm. And I also give uh, some motivational talks uh, to corporates. Um, uh, so in any case, if uh, anyone wants to connect me to the corporates, that that is a good way of uh, like you know helping me in the sure. expeditions because this helps me uh, fund my expeditions and uh, yeah of course uh, any sponsorship opportunities uh, definitely any marketing branding opportunities right. if it is there like mountaineering is a great way to showcase uh, the products uh, so yeah Absolutely. there are many ways and uh, most importantly just keep me in your prayers i think that would be even more valuable for me Absolutely, absolutely. That is a given. But uh, even otherwise, in uh, any any which way we can within our limits, we will definitely we will share all the links to uh, Satya's Facebook page as well as his other resources that one can uh, go ahead and contribute to. I mean, uh, this is a dream of a lot of people see, but um, I know only a handful of them have the courage and the willpower and the mental strength to kind of see it through, as in your case. So I urge. Uh, sincerely that all our listeners also come ahead and contribute to this effort that Satya has been taking and making all of us proud and uh, as he said Karnataka is his karma bhumi now so I hope a lot of us do come forward and contribute to this effort that Satya has taken up and then Satya just in terms of the next expeditions coming your way you didn't mention that you're aiming to scale the highest volcano when is this what are the timelines you're looking at in June, July, I am planning to climb uh, the highest uh, volcanoes in Australia, that is in Papua New Guinea, and uh, then I'll go to Iran in July, okay. and Mexico in October, and in January, I have to climb uh, the highest volcano in Antarctica, uh-huh. so that's a huge, huge uh, expense, like 45 lakh rupees, hmm. and um, then even I have to also go and finish my adventurous grand slam by completing the skiing of north pole wow. uh, so that then uh, so these are all in the line mm-hmm. and and as i always say to all the listeners like you know that dreaming is very very important and no matter how absurd it might seem never stop dreaming or never put limits and boundaries to your dreams so just dream big and then even just dreaming won't help so you have to go ahead and take every step towards your dream and uh, you have to chase your dream so dream big and chase your dreams that's all i have to say for my wonderful listeners absolutely on that profound note thank you so much satya you are truly an inspiration to all of us not just in terms of mountaineering but in just in terms of dreaming dreaming big and following up those dreams with actions we wish you all the best of luck and the best of health for all your upcoming expeditions thank you so much satya for sharing your story with with us and our listeners thank you musafir stories that was yet another great episode of the musafir stories if you guys like the show please subscribe to us on itunes or apple podcasts audio boom Seven Pocket Casts, Castbox, Stitcher, or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android. Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories. Or if it suits you, you could email us at themusafirstories at gmail dot com, or visit our website at www dot themusafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then, happy travels and goodbye.